this service before you. Father, we ask your Holy Spirit to minister to every precious person in this place today, Father God. Father, we bring Linda before you. We ask you, Lord, to heal her, Father, by the stripes of Jesus. She's been healed and made whole, Father. Father, give, uh, let your ministering angels minister to her while she's in bed. Father God, we pray for pit, Father. We pray for healing and restoration. We pray for Sonnet and for Bianca, Father. We pray for Lloyd's mother, Carol, Father. We pray, Lord, that you give them a touch, a mighty touch, Lord, that they will be raised up to life in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah, Lord. We invite your precious Holy Spirit to have full control over this service, Father. We thank you, Lord, that Pastor Bob will preach the oracles of God. We just thank you, Lord, for the gift of healing and uh, gift of discerning of the spirits this morning, Father God. But, Father, we just thank you for your love, your patience, your kindness, your goodness, Father. We thank you for miracles, signs, and wonders in this place today, Father. Touch our hearts, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Burn your fire in our hearts this morning. Burn your fire, your Holy Spirit, fire in our hearts this morning, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. I'm just going to read from uh, Philippians 4, uh, uh, verse 4. It says there, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your request to God. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is, uh, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about it, such things. Whatever you have learned or received and heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the peace of God will be with you. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for peace in our hearts this morning. Father, as we go out and praise and worship you, Lord, and give you of our very rest, worship and thanksgiving, Father. It's all about you. It's not about us, Father God. Oh, we just thank you for your love in this place this morning, Lord. Touch every precious person. Heal, restore, renew them, Father. Renew their minds in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise, honor, and glory in this place this morning. Hallelujah, Amen. Lord. We are so grateful. We love you, Father. We just thank you, Lord, for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm reaching for the heart, giving everything to my life and this. What I need for you, the Holy
said to me, I've got to tell people in the church, they must speak life yes, over death situations. Yes. Faith yes. changes circumstances. And our words should be words of faith. No words of fear, no words of doubts, no words of in agreement with what the world says and what the doctors say. And the doctors are doing a good job. Make no mistake about it. But they base all their assumptions all their decisions are based on what they see medically from their training and from their experience. But what we say is based on what God says in His Word. And that's all God wants. He's looking for some of us to come into agreement and to speak life over that situation. And then He took me further. And He said it's even not just about Pete's or about Sonnet's, but it's also about all of the people in your church when they are facing storms. Let me tell you that if you take a toothpaste tube, you will never see what color the toothpaste is until you squeeze the tube and the toothpaste shoots out. And it's like us. You don't know how we are in our faith walk, how strong we are spiritually until the pressure is on and we are squeezed. In other words, when we face storms, trials, tribulations, or words, our words then matter very much. Lee and myself, we spend a lot of times correcting ourselves. If I say something negative, she'll correct me. And I do the same with her as well. So that we can try and keep our words, life words, faith words, positive words. You see, our words reveal what is in our hearts. I'm not going to keep you too long today. But our words reveal what is in our hearts. Is it fear in our hearts? Or is it faith in our hearts? And it reveals who we trust. Are we trusting man? Are we trusting ourselves? Or are we trusting God? So I would like you this morning, we're just going to look at a couple of examples in the Bible and uh, how God really, really finds importance in the words we speak. So I'd like you to go to 2 Kings chapter 8. When I read this story now, it reminds me so much of that morning when I went with Lee to the doctor to find out the results of the biopsy that she had and all the rest of it. And uh, I'm sure Lee will see as we read this as well. I wanted to read it out of the NIV, and I'll come on to King James Version again. <clears throat> 2 Kings chapter... Yeah, chapter 8. And I think it's verse 8. Let me just see. Let 
Let's go down verse 23. Ach, no man. Two Kings chapter 8. Where, where, um, where the Shunam might, 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 Shunam might woman, her son is dead and he lays, he, he uh, raises him up from the dead. Do you know where that is, Tom? Help me, please. Shunamites. I'm trying to see if I can find it here. Tell me. It's in two kings. Is it four, right? Chapter four. Let's go there. Yeah, I think you're right, Demi. Yeah. I think it is chapter four. I've forgotten. Yeah. To, I haven't written down the chapter. You see, I've written down verses eight to thirty-six. Two Kings chapter four verse eight. Yes, here we go. All right, I want to read you from verse eight through to verse thirty-six. Now it happened one day that Elisha, remember the prophet Elisha, mighty man of God, went to Shun Shunem, where there was a notable woman, a well-known woman, and she persuaded him to eat some food. So it was. As often as he passed by, he returned in there to eat some food. And the Shunammite woman said to her husband, Look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Verse 10, she says to her husband, Please let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed there for him and a table and a chair and a lampstand. So that whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there and rest. Verse 11. And it happened one day that he came there and he turned into the upper room and lay down there. Then he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call this Shunammite woman. And when Gehazi had called her, she stood before him, before Elijah. And Elijah, and he said to him, Say now to her, Elijah said to his servant, Say now to her, Look, you have been concerned for us with all this care you've taken us. What can we, we do for you? Or what can I do for you? Do you want me to speak on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. So he said, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Actually, she has no son, and her husband is old. He must have heard she wanted to have a son or something. Verse 15, so he called her. He, sorry, so he said, Elisha said, call her. When he had called her, she stood in the doorway. Then Elisha said, About this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, No, my lord, man of God. Do not lie to your maidservant. But the woman conceived and bore a son. When the appointed time had come, of which Elisha had told her, I just want to say to you, we were listening on the Christian TV to some women that were testifying this morning, and the one caught my attention, and she had difficulty conceiving. Her and her husband were trying to have a baby, and they'd been trying for a long time, and they were having great difficulty. And she started to get into a state because she feared getting old and not having a child. And this is what has happened with a Shunammite woman. And while we're on the subject, I just want to wish all the mothers yes. a happy Mother's Day. Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. I heard a story. Mummies, listen to this story. I heard a story. And... Uh, it was about two sons, and they were at the mother's funeral. And the pastor, uh, he was up at the pulpit, and the coffin was in front of the pulpit. 
and the people were walking past the coffin. Was an, it was an open coffin, and the people were walking past, and the sons came walking past the coffin, and they just walked past as if it was any normal thing of the day. No sign of any emotion, sadness, or anything. Anyway, he did the funeral, and it was all over with. Then a few months later, there was another funeral, and it was their nanny. She was a colored lady, a Latino, a Mexican, or something like that, because this was in America. And she died. And the same pastor was doing her funeral. And she was in the cask casket in front of his pulpit again. And the people were walking past. And here come the, came the sons. And they were crying. They were beside themselves. They were inconsolable. And they were so happy. And they stopped. And they looked at her face. And they cried. They shed tears over her body. After that funeral, the pastor went to the two sons because he couldn't work this out. And he, he said to them what was troubling him. When we did your mother's funeral, you walked past. You didn't show any emotion or anything. But when we did the funeral of your nanny, you were beside yourself. You were broken men. And the son said, because my mother spent her life trying to please my father and they were always busy at trying to make money. But the nanny, she was the one who welcomed us home from school and hugged us. She was the one that put a plaster on a sore finger. She was the one that made sure we were bathed and clean. She was the one that fed us. And she was the one the next morning who would walk us to the school and say goodbye to us. She was more of a mother to them. That's, what's, that's what a mother is all about. In Jesus' name. I just felt the Lord wanted me to share that with you this morning. My mum's in heaven. Hallelujah. She's been there for a while. His mum is in heaven as well. So we haven't got mothers to wish Happy Mother's Day to, to pay tribute. But the Bible tells us to honour our mothers. Honour our mothers. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So that's for somebody that's watching by video. Just to let you know, your mother is precious, your mother is special. How I wish I had my mother here to hug her and to kiss her and to tell her I love her. How I wish I had my mother-in-law here, Teresa, who was like my own mother to me, to hug her and to kiss her and to tell her that I love her. And you know, before you know where you are, time goes just like that. And they're gone. And you've had all your chances to speak right to them, in Jesus' name. Anyway, let's go on with this. Verse 17, and he, so she said, No, my Lord, man of God, do not lie to your maidservant, because he prophesied that she's going to embrace a son in a year's time. And she's now taken back with this, and she's been trying all this time, she's finding it hard to believe. And so she exclaims, Do not Lie to your maidservants, verse 17. But the woman conceived, and she bore a son. When the appointed time had come, of which Elisha had told her, and the child grew. Now it happened one day that he went out to his father, to the reapers. And he said to his father, my head, my head. Uh, this is the King James way of talking. My, my father, father, daddy, daddy. So he said to his servant, carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat her on her knee till noon, and then he died. This is the son now. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God. You see, she reckoned, remember she spoke to her husband, she said he is a holy man, he is a just man, there's something about him. And she recognized the anointing on his life. And she took her son, who gave all the appearances of being dead, and she laid him on Elisha's bed. Then she shut the door upon him, and she went out. We catch this. Then, verse 22, she called her to her husband and said, Please send me one of the young men and one of the donkeys, that I may run to the man of God and come back. And so her husband said, Why are you going to him today? It's neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. Listen to what this, this kid's mother says. She doesn't say, our son is dead. I want to go and get him to pray for him. She says, it is well. It is well. 
Then she saddled a donkey and said to her servant, Drive and go forward. Do not slacken your pace for me unless I tell you. And so she departed and went to the man of God at Mount Carmel. So it was when the man of God saw her afar off that he said to his servant Gehazi, Look, the Shunammite woman, please run now to meet her and say to her, Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with your child? But she answered and said, It is well. Now when she came to the man of God at the hill, she caught him by the feet, but Gehazi, Gehazi came near to push her away. But the man of God said, Leave her alone, for her soul is in deep distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Let's just stop and pause for a minute there. She didn't say to her husband, Our son is dead! And when Gehazi came out to ask her if everything's well with her son and with her husband and all the rest of it, what did she She didn't say, no, he's dead, he's dead, we've lost him. She said, it is well. It is well. When the doctor said to Lee, I'm sorry, Leonora, it's cancer and it's not good. Lee said to her, doctor, the God has told me all is well. All is well. It is well. We need to use words that contradict the circumstances when the circumstances appear to be devastating. When there appears to be death, we need to speak life. When uh, there appears to be sickness, we need to be to talking health in Jesus' name. We need to be speaking words in agreement with what God's word says. She did. She did cry out for help. When we go down to verse 28, she said to Elijah, Did I ask a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then Elijah said to Gehazi, Get yourself ready and take my staff in your hand and be on your way. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not answer him. But lay my staff on the face of the child. That's a very, very deep, spiritual thing there. He says, if you meet somebody, don't speak to them. If they speak to you, don't answer them. Keep on going. Don't say a word, but take this staff and lay it on her son. The reason being, you cannot pollute what God is going to do with the world. You cannot pollute it with worldly belief, with worldly acceptance. God is far above that. God spoke and it was. It's a pure faith. I was talking about this with Trenton yesterday or the day before. And Trenton said to me, he must have been got it from one of the preachers he listens to. We speak a love language, Gramps. And we speak a language. Did you know we speak a language of war? <laughs> and he's quite right. There is a love language. I love you, my sweetheart. Sure, you're looking glamorous today. I'm a lucky man. I married you. And stuff like that. It's love talk. In Jesus' name. Then there's war talk. You talk to me like that again, I'll punch you on the nose. <laughs> but God only has one language. God only has one language. It's a language of faith. It's a language of belief. It's a language of, of hope which is mixed into it and, and encouragement. That's God's language. That's what he's looking for us to speak. God's looking for us to speak faith and belief. Life over a death situation in Jesus' name. Provision over a lack situation in Jesus' name. Healing and health over a sick situation. Freedom over a situation of captivity in Jesus, Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. So he says, and lay my staff on the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. Now Gehazi went on ahead of them and laid down, laid the staff on the face of the child. 
but there was neither voice nor hearing. In other words, there was no response. Therefore, he went back to meet Elijah, and he told him, saying, The child has not awakened. When Elijah came into the house, there was the child lying dead on his bed. Jesus faced a very similar circumstance, and he went into the room. And when he went into the room, the person that was lying there, he chased everybody else out of the room, and he just kept two of his closest disciples with him. Ones that he knew he could trust to speak life. One, ones that he knew would be in agreement with him before he did the resurrection. When they called him because Lazarus, his friend, had died and been buried. When they come running and they said to him, your, fr your friend Lazarus, he's dead. What Jesus said, he didn't say, oh my goodness, oh, when's the funeral? He turned around and he said, he's not dead. He's just sleeping. And then he went and raised him from the dead. Are you with me? Very quietly this morning. When Elisha came into the house, verse 32, there was a child, child lying dead on his bed. He went there in therefore, shut the door behind the two of them and prayed to the Lord. And he went up and lay on the child. He put his mouth on the child's mouth, his eyes on the child's eyes. I don't know how he managed all this. And his hands on his hands. And he stretched himself out on the child, and the flesh of the child became warm. You know when it says he stretched himself out on the child, you must understand the mouth was touching his mouth, the eyes were touching each other. And it says he laid himself on the child. And I believe he probably laid himself in the shape of a cross. Verse 35, he returned and walked back and forth in the house and again went up and stretched himself out on the child. Then the child sneezed seven times. Seven times always indicates completion or perfection, a time to rest. Seven times and the child opened his eyes. Hallelujah. And then he called the woman and she came back all emotional and happy in Jesus' name. Do you see what has happened here? She has declared when she had opportunity to break down, when she had opportunity to cry out and to say that her son is dead, she said, all is well. Because she knew if anybody can raise her son back up, it's the anointed man of God, the holy man of God, Elisha. And that's why she put him on Elisha's bed. In Jesus' name. You see in Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 21. Where am I? Proverbs 27 and verse 21. It says the tongue has the power of life and death. And the preachers will preach it till they're blue in the face. But they'll leave out this last bit. And those who love it will eat its fruit. So the tongue has a power of life and death. But whatever it is you're saying, if that's what moves you, if that's what controls your life, you're going to eat its fruit. If you speak death words, and you keep speaking death words, you keep speaking lack, you keep speaking sickness, you keep speaking death words, you're going to eat its fruit. But if you speak life, if you speak provision, if you speak health and healing, you will also eat its fruit. It's a promise of God. And God's not a man that he should lie in Jesus' name. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 12. Are you with me this morning? Yes. You're awfully quiet. Hallelujah. This is to help you. This is to help you to get the right responses when you're in a time of trouble. Matthew chapter 12, verses 20, uh, sorry, 33 to 37. Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 to 37. Jesus is speaking. Listen to what Jesus says. <laughs> Jesus says, either make the tree good and its fruit will be good. Or else make the tree bad and its fruit will be bad. 
Remember when I told you about abiding in the vine? For a tree is known by its fruits. Now here we go for all those that get offended when the pastor is talking under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and he's talking truth and something he says upsets you. Listen to what Jesus said. Brood of vipers! If I was to call you all a brood of vipers, you'd be very upset with me. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? Now catch what he says here. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil things. Verse 36. But I say to you, that for every idle word, we're going to deal with idle words, every idle word men may speak, they will give account for, of it on the day of judgment. Now catch verse 37, we're not finished yet. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. By your words you will be justified, just as if I'd never sinned. And welcome into the kingdom of heaven. And by your words you will be condemned. Condemned to the pit. To the burning pits of hell. In Jesus name. That's how important our words are with God. Now let me just say this to you. Verse 36. But I say to you that for every idle word may, may speak. What does it say in the NIV sweetheart? But I'll tell you that, uh, but I'll tell you that a man will have to give an account. No, 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 no. Sorry. Verse thirty-six. Yes. All right, go on. Verse thirty-six. Sorry, yes, uh, it is right. Yeah. But I'll tell you that man will give, uh, will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. All right. So the NIV says careless word. The New King James Version says idle word. Anybody got another version of the Bible there? Tell me what's yours. Is yours the New Living Translation? Yes, but it just says... Ver verse 36, read it for me. And I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word, word you speak. Alright, so it also says idle word. Let me tell you what God calls idle and what God calls careless. Anything that's not faith. Anything that's not belief. Why do I know that? Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. We have to learn to change our vocabulary. We have to learn to change our outlook on life and not be lined up with the outlook of the world, but with the outlook of what God says in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. There is so much nonsense going on. No, I'm not going to go down that road because I'll get into politics then. All right, so we must be thoughtful and careful with the words that we speak. Now, I've tried to explain to you how important it is to God. Now, I'm going to read you something in Luke chapter 1, which is going to really bring the point home of how important your words are and how you use them with God. Turn to Luke chapter 1. I'm going to read to you from verse 18, Luke chapter 1, from verse 18, whoa, 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 whoa. sorry, 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 I've jumped ahead of me myself, let's go to Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, this is the importance, this will show you now the importance of life words, of positive words, of faith words, hallelujah, Hallelujah. People think we're crazy when we talk life and we talk faith. But we're just talking in agreement with what God says. Right. Romans chapter 10 and verse 8. But what does it say? But what does what say? What does the word of God say? But what does it say? It says the word is near you. In your mouth and in your heart. It's near you. It's here. It's right here. I've been filling for the last 40 years trying to fill my heart with the Word of God. I've missed it in so many places and in so many times. 
but it's an ongoing part of our spiritual growth and it will continue to grow in us until the day that we leave this earth. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So it's the word of faith that is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. It must be in your heart because you come to church and you hear the word of faith. It's seed sown into your heart. You might not take any notice of it, but it's in your heart. I know it's in the heart of the kids because sometimes they, I hear them, they correct me or they, I hear them correcting one another sometimes about how they're speaking. Not to speak death words, not to speak negative words, but to speak life words. And then it goes on to say in verse 9 that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. For with the heart one believes, with your heart you believe unto righteousness, unto God's way of doing things, unto the right way of doing things, righteousness, the faith way, that's God's way, that's the right way as far as God's concerned, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Listen, you can't think it. You can't keep it inside you and think to yourself, well, God knows that I know it. It says here, you have to confess it. You have to confess it. There's only one way to confess anything. That's with your mouth. When you get married, you confess your love for one another. You confess the, 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 the oath that you take, the oath of covenant you take with one another, another, that you stand by each other through thickness and thin, through good and in bad times, through uh, uh, sickness and in health and all this. You confess it with your mouth. So we need to confess what God says about circumstances in Jesus' name. Sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes you might feel uncomfortable. But it's what God requires. We have to during these times. We're living in terrible times. Here in, and it's not just in South Africa. It's not just in South Africa. And you're watching me by videos. Just listen to what I'm going to say quickly now. Because time is running on. And let me tell you this. It's not just in South Africa. All over the world. Times are hard. There's a lady that I, I, I knew, knew and she left South Africa a year ago to go and live with her daughter in England. And she sends me a message this week telling me she can't adjust. She can't change her way from the way she had in South Africa to how they live in, in England. She, can't, she, she had a nice house, a big house, a nice big garden. The sun was shining. And she cannot tolerate all the rain and the small houses, and the small gardens. I, uh, another guy that I know, I spoke to him during the week. He'd been to Europe and all over on holiday with his wife. He came to tell me how much it cost him, and all the rest of it. And I said to him, but at least you have peace over there. No crime, none of, none of this heavy politics we're going through here. And he said to me, do you know what? He said, let me tell you, it's not as nice as it appears overseas. The, other, the grass is not greener on the other side. He said it's so expensive to buy a small pokey house in England. You will pay 500,000 rand today. The reason I'm talking like this is because there's somebody here who's watching my video who's thinking of emigrating. What this guy said was his friends that emigrated years ago, they have settled down there and they're established. But he's got a lot of friends that have gone in the last two years and they're all wishing they could come back. And two of his friends came back and they had to try and get jobs and they couldn't get jobs. They couldn't live as comfortably as they were living before they left. So just take those things into consideration. But what's in your heart? Is it the word of God or is it the circumstances? You can change the circumstances by speaking life over a death situation. You can change the circumstances by speaking uh, provision and prosperity over a situation of lack. 
In Jesus' name. We have to, during these times, keep on building our faith. I spent last night, I was lying on my bed, and I was speaking faith over myself, confessing it over myself so much last night. And we need to be doing it regularly. We have to keep on building our faith and keep on believing our words because that reveals our belief in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's turn in our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12 says this. Let me just change this over. Proverbs chapter 12. And verse 21. Sorry, verse, 20, uh, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 18. And it says, There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword. Remember it tells us in Hebrews that God's word is like a two-edged sword able to divide body, soul, and spirit. Here it says there is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword. In other words, the word of God speak that and you will be able to speak like a two-edged sword, the word of God. But the tongue of the wise promotes health. So be a wise person. Speak health, wealth, and life in Jesus' Amen. mighty name. We must be thoughtful and careful with the words that we speak. Now, I want to take us to that example that I was speaking about in Luke chapter 1, where God is very emphatic about the words that we speak when we want in Him to move mightily and miraculously in our lives. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 18. Luke Chapter 1 and verse 18. Luke chapter 1 and verse 18. Now the angel, let me just give you a background. The angel has appeared to Zacharias. Zacharias was the father of John the Baptist. The angel has appeared to him to tell him that Elizabeth, his wife, is going to give birth. He's going to give Zacharias and Elizabeth the son that they had always wanted. And in verse 18 of Luke chapter 1, it says, And Zacharias said to the angel, How shall I know this? Catch that? He didn't say, Praise the Lord! Hallelujah! I knew God would come through for me. Instead he says, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. Listen to what the angel says. Verse 19. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these good, glad tidings, to bring you this good news. But behold, you will be mute, you will be dumb, and not able to speak until the day that these things have taken place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. You need to just speak the words in faith and believe and they will come to pass in time. And God's timing is always perfect. Amen. It's a separate message. It's a, a very deep, powerful me message that with the words coming to pass in their time. But we'll look at that another time. Let's move down to verse 37. Verse 37. And it says, therefore, with God, nothing will be impossible. This is Mary speaking when the angels uh, appear to Mary to tell her she will conceive by the Holy Spirit. And she answers and says, For with God nothing will be impossible. 
Now, when the angel appeared to Zacharias, he said, How shall I know this? And God made him come. He didn't want him to speak those words anymore. Whereas with Mary, she says, For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me. Do it according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the baby in, leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So she's already conceived. She's already carrying John. And when Mary comes in and speaks, the anointing is so powerful that the baby in Elizabeth's womb leaps. And Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 42. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. She's speaking a blessing over Mary. But why is this granted to me that the mother of the Lord, my Lord, should come to me to visit me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the baby inside me leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Then Mary goes on to, to uh, repeat a blessing. And let's go down verse 57. Now Elizabeth's full time came to her in 57, verse 57. Now Elizabeth's full time came to her to be delivered and she brought forth a son. When her neighbours and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. So it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child and they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. His mother answered and said, No, not Zacharias. He shall be called John. But they said to her, There is one among your relatives who is called by his name. So they made signs to his father, saying he should be called by his name. And he asked her for a writing tablet and wrote, because remember, Zacharias can't speak. The angel has told him he's going to be mute until these things come to pass. So he asked for a tablet to write on, and he writes down there, his name is John. And they all marveled. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosened and he spoke, praising God. So here we see Zacharias doubted the angel, doubted what that God had sent the angel to tell him, to proclaim. He said to him, how can this be? And the angel said, you will be mute. You cannot speak death. You cannot speak negative. You cannot speak a, a, a fear and doubt over something that God has proclaimed. What has he proclaimed? He's proclaimed healing in our lives. He's proclaimed life and salvation. Amen. He's proclaimed provision. In Jesus' name. God's importance, God has places great importance on the words that we speak. And I'm nearly finished. I want us to go to John chapter 19. We're nearly finished now. Hallelujah. John chapter 19. John chapter 19, verse 30, Jesus is on the cross. Now we've just been reading how important it is for us to speak God's kind of words, faith kind of words, life over a death situation, and things like that. We've just seen how important it is to God. Because God's word is always final. God always has the last right. word. Amen. And in John chapter 19, yeah. verse 30, Jesus is on the cross. He's being crucified. And he told them in verse 28, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, he said, I thirst, I'm thirsty. And then a vessel full of water, oh sorry, a vessel full of sour wine 
was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with a sour wine and put it on his hook and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he then said, It is finished. What's finished? Salvation is finished. Not salvation itself is finished, but the way to salvation is finished. He did it all, and by his stripes we have been healed. Healing is finished. It's there for us, for us to acquire, for us to obtain in Jesus' mighty name. Jesus said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. They never killed him. He gave up his spirit. In Jesus' mighty name. I want to read to you very, very quickly, because time's going on now. The last scripture found in Luke chapter 8. The last scripture in Luke chapter 8. When we pray, we often pray that when it comes to the service, that the word, seed of the word is sown into the hearts of the listeners, you're listening by video, sown into your heart, in Jesus' name, that it takes fruit, uh, sorry, it takes root and produces fruit. And we bind the devil up that he's not permitted to steal the seed of the word. You see, the seed of the word is the word of God. They, TV evangelists and people like that, they'll come on and tell you, seed, be seed-minded and not need-minded. Very correct. But what does Jesus say about the seed? Let's read in Luke chapter 8, verse 4. And when a great multitude had gathered, and they came to Jesus from every city, he spoke a parable. He said, A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. There was no soil for it. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. Some, you know, when the word goes into the heart of some people, the cares of the world strangle that word. That's what we call weeds on the seed. Verse 8, but others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. And when Jesus had said these things, he cried, He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Then his disciples Asked him, saying, what does this parable mean? And Jesus said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables. So that, seeing, they might not see, and hearing, they may not understand. Now I'm going to explain it to you. Verse 11. Now the parable is this. Catch what Jesus says. The parable is this. The seed is the word of God. It's the seed of the word of God. It's the seed that says you must give, and it will be given unto you, good measure, press. That's what you should sow. It's the seed of the word that says, by his stripes you have been healed. That's a word you should sow. It's the word of God, the seed of the word of God that says, be anxious for nothing but in all prayer and supplication. Make your request unto God and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will fill your heart and fill your mind. That's the seed that you should sow. So Jesus said in verse 11, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear that the devil comes and take away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Verse 13, but the one, ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and no, these have no root, who believe for a little while, and in time of temptation fall away. No, pastor, I came to church for two weeks. I came to church for two weeks. And I didn't see anything that God was doing in my life. Mm -mm. You've got to stay focused. You've got to keep on believing 
and keep on keeping on. Verse 14, Now the ones that fell among the thorns are the ones when they have heard go and are choked with the cares, with the riches, and with the pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. Do you understand what he's saying? Verse 15, But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who having heard the word with a noble and good heart keep it and bear fruits with patience. Patience is such a mighty ingredient when it comes to faith. So there you have it today, my friends. That's what it's all about. God wants us to speak the right words, to use the right words. God wants us, you know what we've got to do? We've got to get this word, the word of God, We've got to study it and read it and get our hearts full of it so that when the pressure comes on, when we're squeezed like the toothpaste tube, when we squeeze, what comes out is the Word of God. The Word of God. I'm sorry, it's cancer. It's not good. All is well, doctor. All is well. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. So now we're going to take partake of communion in the name of Jesus. Jesus said to us, when we do this, we must do it in remembrance of Him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We do it in remembrance of Him. All my helpers are gone. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Bill. In Jesus' name. And He held up the bread. He said, this is my body. It wasn't really his body. It represented his body. He said, this is my body. Whenever you eat it, do it in remembrance of me. Do it in remembrance of what? Do it in remembrance of the price that he paid for your healing. What took place on his body? He said, this is his body. His body was beaten. And by the stripes that fell on his back, you are healed. So when we eat this, we're consuming his healing. In Jesus' name, let's consume our healing together. And then the cup. <clears throat> the cup of grace. And he held it up and he said, This is my blood which is shed for you. Father God, we just thank you that Jesus shed his blood so that we could be saved. And we apply his blood to our minds. We apply his blood to our households. In Jesus' mighty name, let's drink together. Oh, hallelujah. Can bring you both better. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Excuse the microphone. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Father, the people in this prayer request book, Father, we thank you, Lord, for provision, for healing, for divine alignment, divine intervention, supernatural wealth transfer, supernatural debt cancellation, Father God. Father, we thank you, Lord, that those who are crying out to you this morning will hear from you, Father God. You will touch their lives, Father, for the better. You will heal and restore them. You will renew them, Father God. Yes, You'll give Lord. them the desires of their heart, Father God. We yes, just thank you, Lord, for your blessing on every precious person in Jesus' mighty name, Lord. Yes, that Lord. this week they can go out and skip with joy because and yes, sing. Look what the Lord has amen. done. We just thank you for that right now in thank Jesus' you, mighty name, thank Lord. You, Jesus. We thank you, Father. It's good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men pour into our bosom. Father, yes, amen. we thank you, Lord, for uh, that uh, the tithe as Father will receive a hundredfold return, Father. Bless them abundantly, yes, Father. Lord. Give them the desires of their heart in Jesus' mighty amen. name. Amen. Hallelujah, amen. hallelujah. Jesus. You know what? If you show yourself faithful to the Lord, He'll show Himself faithful to you. Yes. So keep on sowing. Never stop. It doesn't matter what your situation looks like. Just keep on sowing. 
and it'll be good measure. Press down, shake it together. Running over shall men give back into your bosom. So yes, expect amen. that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 That the Lord bless you, keep you, make his face shine yes. upon you, be gracious to you, and give you peace in Jesus', Jesus mighty, mighty name. name. Have a blessed week. Yes. Hallelujah. Lord. Amen. I just need to do this. There are people watching this today who have not made Jesus the Lord of your life. I read to you from the scriptures that said, The word is near us, it's in our hearts, it's in our mouths. You've heard the word today, so now it's in your hearts. It's on your mouth waiting to come out, be confessed. And he said, if you confess Jesus right. as the Son of God, you will be saved. So just say with me this morning, Father, Father I, come to you, I come to you and I confess, and I confess that Jesus, that Jesus is, is the, Son of, the Son of God. He's your Son, He's Lord. Your Son Lord. Jesus, come into my life. Jesus, come into my life. And I thank you that I am now saved. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.